Welcome everyone. We're going to get started here in, uh, in just under three minutes. If you can hear the audio and see the welcome screen with Tickmill, could you type a Y in the chat box, please? Great stuff, thanks a lot. Okay guys, welcome to today's session, the first in our, our online education series. Um, I'm just gonna cover uh, some disclaimers here, which uh, obviously are obviously very important, and uh, please take time to just briefly read those so you, uh, you fully understand uh, the risks involved in, uh, in foreign exchange trading. So welcome to, uh, to the, as I say, to this, this first in our online education series. We, over the, the coming months, are going to be covering everything from the basics of foreign exchange, which we're going to look at today, uh, moving on to uh, what it means to actually be a trader, how we, uh, how we look to approach the markets to, to hopefully profit from trading strategies. And at the end, we're actually going to move into looking at some of the, the trading strategies that I've employed over the years. But first of all, what I want to do today is just um, give a brief introduction of myself and the, the context uh, to the capacity in which I'm, I'm presenting today. Uh, I've been trading personal and external investor capital for nearly 15 years. However, I haven't always been involved in markets. After graduating back in 98, I entered the world of consulting with a specific focus on executive search. After a couple of years working for a city PLC, I jumped ship and co-founded a boutique executive search firm that experienced some rapid growth and I eventually cashed in my stake in 2004. And post that exit, I had a chunk of capital and a whole bunch of time on my hands, so I decided to explore my passion for markets. And interest that was piqued from having a front row seat to the dot-com boom and bust, seeing people make and lose fortunes overnight. I started trading the e-mini S&P futures in a market that was predominantly trending north. I cut some very lucky early breaks and started making some solid and then really some significant gains. However, as is a common tale in this game, my beginner's luck reversed course pretty rapidly and I ended up giving back all my gains and then some. It was at this point I thought to myself, I either walk away from this or I commit completely and get really serious about this endeavor. So what I decided to do was I sought out a mentor who demonstrated excellence in the field of trading, and I started to seriously apply myself as a student of risk. It was a period during which I became considerably more self-aware. My mentor really helped me focus, not just on my technical game, but more importantly, my mental game. By 2007, I had a solidly and extensively back-tested market approach, and more importantly, a documented business plan underpinned by a rigorous risk management strategy. 
I then set about executing this strategy, and since 2008, I've been consistently profitable on an annual basis, which is the only P&L performance metric I'm really interested in. I'm not interested or affected by the outcome of individual trades. My focus is on my trading edge, demonstrating itself over an extended series of outcomes. Since 2013, I've been managing external investor capital, which now represents a multi-million dollar portfolio. Since 2010, I've personally mentored hundreds of private traders of all experience levels, from complete novices to former CME floor traders, in helping them to develop trading strategies to reap consistent returns from the markets. I've consulted to numerous brokers and trading education brands, contributing written webinar and live presentation content on a range of topics from market analysis to trading strategy development and execution. I'm currently the head of trading and trader education at a leading trading education firm called FX Career Swap. I also manage and run a prop trading team for a company called Little Fish FX. I can attest that after developing a successful non-markets and now successful trading business, that the common thread in success is persistence, discipline, and patience. If you're trading on a hunch or a gut feel, I can guarantee you that you can expect to liquidate your accounts. Like any other commercial endeavor, trading requires a serious commitment and the persistence to take the hits and keep going, the discipline to develop and execute a plan, and the patience to incrementally increase your account equity over time. If you're looking for a fast buck, forget it. There's way more fun to be had on the blackjack tables in Vegas. At least you get free booze there while you're handing over your hard-earned cash. Right, so that gives you a, a flavor of where I'm coming from. And what we're going to start with today is really just covering the basics of Forex so that we all have a, a common understanding as we proceed into, uh, into more complex discussions over the, over the coming weeks and months. Maybe this is your first step into the world of Forex, or perhaps you're an advanced trader wanting to brush up on some of your skills. Either way, this course and these sessions have been designed with you in mind. This is the introductory session, a comprehensive but hopefully painless coverage of some of the important basics of the foreign exchange markets. By the time we've completed today's session, you should be able to cut through Forex jargon with ease, clearly understand how currencies are priced relative to each other, and appreciate market behavior. Furthermore, you'll recognize who the market players are and whom you'll be trading against. You'll understand the effects of trading during various times of day, learn how to calculate the value of a pip, and discover various methods for executing trades, and you'll be introduced to Forex trade analysis. So what is Forex? Forex simply stands for foreign exchange, in the same way that FX is taken to represent foreign exchange. Forex and FX can be used interchangeably. Forex is the largest financial market in the world but it's not a physical market, and therefore it has no central exchange. There is no big Forex building in London or New York, or anywhere else for that matter. If you buy one currency using another, whether you're in your local bank, on an online exchange, or even at the airport, you're participating in the Forex market. This market covers everything from you buying your foreign currency for your holiday, abroad through to large international companies, hedging their exposure, to the different countries they operate in, and of course, everything in between. So what is foreign exchange trading? Trading is simply the process of buying and then selling something with the goal of generating a profit. In Forex trading, we buy one currency using another. This can also be thought of as buying one currency and selling another. If someone buys yen and uses dollars to pay for them, they are buying yen at the same time selling dollars. As with all markets, the current price of a currency is based on what the market is prepared to pay for it. In Forex, this is called the exchange rate between currencies, often simply referred to as the rate. The exchange rate is simply a measure of what the market thinks one unit of currency is worth versus another. So what is a currency pair? As mentioned, Forex trading is the simultaneous act of buying one currency and selling another. Currencies are traded through a broker or a dealer and are always traded in pairs. For example, the Euro US dollar or the EUR USD, as you can see on the screen, is not, or, or the British pound and the Japanese yen, 
You'll quickly get used to this format. This is not a real currency pair, but taking our sticks and stones example, the pair would look, as you can see on the screen. When you trade the foreign exchange markets, you always buy or sell in currency pairs. So what are the major currency pairs? Currencies included on the screen above I can show you the majors because they are the most widely traded pairs. The symbol you can see, the country you can see, the currency and the nickname. So we have the US dollar, United States dollar or the buck. We have the EUR, the Eurozone members, Euro, Fiber. We have the JPY, Japanese Yen or the Yen. We have the GBP, the Great British Pound or Cable. We have the CHF, the Swiss Franc or the Swissy. We have the CAD, the Canadian Dollar or the Looney. We have the AUD, Australian Dollar or the Aussie. We also have the NZD, New Zealand Dollar or the Kiwi. Currency symbols without fail have three letters. Traditionally, the first two letters identify the name of the country. And the third letter identifies the name of that country's currency. The exception to this is the euro, which had to be awkward and have a group of countries. This is simply written as EUR. But if you take GBP, for instance, GB stands for Great Britain, while P stands for pounds. So the symbol for the Great British Pound is GBP. Two of these symbols are then combined to indicate the currency that is being bought and the currency which is being sold. For example, buying GBP USD indicates that the Great British Pounds are being bought while the United States dollars are being sold. Likewise, selling EUR GBP indicates that Euros are being sold while Great British Pounds are being bought. And that introduces us to the idea of the base versus counter. So currencies, it's clear now that Forex is quoted in pairs of currencies. In the example, EUR USD, the value of one euro, is being expressed in terms of US dollars, or how many dollars one euro costs. Here's a tip. It may be helpful to consider the euro as the product and the dollars as the money, because the euro is the product, it's called the base currency. The counter currency is simply the currency that the base currency is measured against. In this example, the US dollar, therefore, is if 10,000 units of Euro USD are bought, 10,000 euros are being bought, while an equivalent amount of dollars denoted by EUR USD exchange rate are being sold. So now let's take a look at what a pip is. A pip refers to the unit of measurement used to express the change in value between two currencies. Pip or pip stands for percentage in point. Note that the different currency pairs are quoted to a different amount of decimal places. So if you refer to a PIP, be clear as to which currency you mean. If the Euro USD moves from 127.12.9 to 127.13.9, that's a 0 0.001 US dollar change in the value and is equal to one PIP. It's 1% of 1%. Many brokers these days quote prices to five decimal places. This is 0.1% of 1% and is eloquently referred to as a pickaxe. The quote currency pairs are quoted as three previously two decimal places of accuracy rather than five, as in the Euro USD. Pairs containing the Japanese yen are a typical example. The long term average for the JPY against the dollar is over 100. So if this was quoted to five decimal places, not only would it involve an eight digit number, but the value of the pip would be negligible. In cases such as this, a change <coughs> in USD JPY from 99 to 99.10 is a change in price of one pip. It's key to understand what a pip is in order to work out trade profits and losses. If you trade using a spread betting firm, then chances are you're fixing the value of a pip to something like one pound, per, uh, one pound per pip or 10 pounds per pip. This means every one pip change you trade makes or loses one pound or 10 pounds. If you're trading the spot market, as we do here, then actually the value of the pip will change depending on the currency your account is denominated in and the currency pair you're actually trading. 
Ideally, you'd want to know how to calculate this, but in reality, your broker will provide you with the exact value of a pip. What you need to understand is that the pip value varies based on the exchange rate of currency pairs. And so not all pips are equal. This means that when trading several different currency pairs in the spot Forex, consistently using the same size trades, not all trades will be worth the same amount. For example, 10,000 notional on the Euro USD and 10,000 notional on the Euro GBP from a UK account denominated in GBP could be worth very different amounts. So now we understand what the, the basics of the market are, let's move on to look at the players involved in the market. Market players until the late 90s were only really the big guys could be involved in the game. The initial requirement that you could trade was only if you had significant funds, meaning millions in the bank. Forex trading was traditionally intended to be for banks and large institutions, and not for the little guys like us. However, because of the rise of the internet, online, online Forex trading firms are now able to offer trading accounts to retail traders. So let's take a look at the mix, who's in the mix in terms of the players. So we're gonna start with the retail traders, you and me. Although, the small, although we, are the smallest part of the market in terms of individual trade size, retail traders and speculators make up 90% of all trading volume. They engage in the Forex market for no other reason than to make money through buying and selling currencies. This category includes everyone from hedge funds through to retail traders at home trading a hundred pound account. The statistics show that retail traders are only about 30% accurate at picking the trend of the market. You might assume that hedge funds, et cetera, will be better, but in fact, a lot of hedge funds focus on making low probability, very high reward trade ideas, basically long shots. This means they can actually be wrong a lot of the time, but if they get it right, they win very big. You may recall a few of the financial crash stories brought about by this type of activity. Retail traders remain a growing market and will have increasingly bigger impact in coming years. What's likely, however, is that they will continue their losing ways on average. So what we want to do is make sure we are not in that 30% and we are in, sorry, we want to make sure we're in the 30% and not the 70% who are consistently getting it wrong. So who are the other big players? Well, the financial institutions, mainly the banks. The largest of the players in the Forex markets are actually the banks. Since the Forex spot market, note spot market refers to the buying and selling of currencies for cash right now, as opposed to any longer term bets through futures or forward contracts. The spot market does not have a central exchange, as I mentioned earlier. The largest banks in the world are left to determine the exchange rates by trading with each other. The prices they trade at provide the market with the bid and ask levels. As a retail trader, we buy at the ask price and we sell at the bid price. These prices are normally based on the supply and demand for currencies that they themselves are seeing through their customers. Bid is essentially the price a large financial institution is willing to buy the currency at, and therefore the price you can sell it at. The ask price is the price the large financial institution is willing to sell the currency at, and therefore it is the price you can buy it at. The reason that the bid and ask is reversed for the bank and the customer is because the bank is the market maker and the customer is the market taker. The bank is obliged to quote a price regardless of whether they want to trade or not. Their reward for this is the difference in the price between the bid and the ask, otherwise known as the spread. These large banks, collectively referred to as the interbank market, take on a large amount of forex transactions each day for both their customers and for themselves. The real thing you need to know about the banks is that they are few people that have a full picture of the order book. They can often tell where moves will happen before they actually do. That said, banks also make money on commissions. So if they make more money through commissions on a losing trade, then they will take it. However, in the long run, you want to be on the side of the banks. This is why the COT report, the Commitment of Traders report, is often very powerful. And that's something we'll discuss in later sessions. Next in line are the governments and central banks. These guys are regularly involved in the Forex market. Just like companies, national governments participate in the Forex market for their operations, including international trade payments and handling their foreign exchange reserves. Meanwhile, central banks 
directly affect the forex market when they adjust interest rates to control inflation or to stimulate growth. By doing this, they can effectively adjust their interest rates to control inflation or to stimulate more growth. All, all, with all else being equal, which it seldom is in forex markets, global money moves to the currency with the highest interest rate, thus driving up the price of that currency. There are also instances where the central banks intervene in the forex market, either directly or verbally, when they want to realign their exchange rates. Sometimes central banks think that their currency is priced too high or too low, so they start massive sell or buy operations to alter exchange rates. There have also been a lot of verbal interventions over the years, often referred to as forward guidance or rhetoric or even jawboning. It's important to keep an eye on this as it can often affect the overall tone of the market and therefore longer term trends in the currency. Finally, we have large commercial companies. These players are in the market that, uh, that was basically originally designed for and built for them because large commercial companies take part in foreign exchange markets for the purposes of doing business. For example, major airlines are often required to buy fuel for their planes in a number of different countries or car manufacturers need to buy car parts from all over the world. So they use the foreign exchange market to get the best deal on their currency needs. The key here is that the majority of these companies use the Forex market to protect themselves against adverse currency movements. This is called hedging. If a European company knows it has $10 million in invoices due in over the next six months, it will often lock in at today's exchange rate for the sake of certainty. To do this, they use forward contracts. These are derived from the spot price, but will differ slightly according to the length of time the, the exchange rate has to be locked in for. So now that you understand the players, the real trick comes down to who to follow. Retail traders are often right over the medium term time frame, but they are more often than not wrong in the longer term trends where the real money is made. Therefore, you should generally play against them in longer trends. Remembering the two adages, don't follow the crowd and the trend is your friend. Banks will take small losing positions to earn good commissions, but tend to be right on any of the big moves. Therefore, we want to try and follow them. One final note of caution, be on the lookout for central bank action. They have the power to override the whole market just by using a well-placed sentence. So be sure to know when the high profile meetings and press conferences are scheduled as these are always likely to impact the direction of the market. So now that we understand the players in the market, well, how do we actually participate in the market? How do we place orders? Well, let's look at the types of orders. The term order refers to how you will enter or exit a trade. In this, session, in this section now, we'll discuss the different types of orders that can be placed in the foreign exchange markets. There are some basic order types that all brokers provide, and some others that are a bit more complex. Be sure that you know which type of orders your broker will accept. Different brokers accept different types of orders. A market order is an order to buy or sell at the best available price. Essentially, you get into the market straight away at whatever price you can. Just remember, you buy at the ask price and sell at the bid price. A limit entry order. A limit entry order is an order placed to either buy below the market or sell above the market at a certain price. These are generally used when traders want to enter the market in a value area. For instance, if a trader thinks that the market is going to retrace from highs before moving higher again, he might use a limit buy below the current price so that when the market retraces, he can go long for the push higher. This is a useful technique if you can't watch the market 24 seven, as these orders will fill automatically. But be aware, if the market doesn't retrace, you'll be left with an open position. Also, once you've placed an order such as this, it's easy to forget about it. So check regularly whether you have any open limit orders on your terminal. A stop entry order. A stop entry order is an order placed to buy above the market or sell below the market at a certain price. It is similar to the limit order, but typically used in breakout plays. Here, traders are waiting for a currency to break through a level before entering in the direction of the breakout. They will place a stop entry order at the breakout level to get into the trade shortly after it breaks out. 
a stop loss order. A stop loss order is a type of order linked to a trade for the purpose of pre preventing additional losses. If price goes against you, a stop loss order remains in effect until the position is liquidated or you cancel the stop loss order. Stop losses are extremely useful for traders who don't want to sit in front of their monitors all day, worried that they'll lose money. They are the cornerstone of good risk and money management and something we'll discuss in more detail in future sessions. Finally, a trailing stop. A trailing stop is a type of stop loss attached to a trade that moves as price fluctuates. As the price ratchets in the profitable direction of, of your trade, it essentially locks in profit as the trade goes in your direction until the stop is hit. So now we understand how to place the orders, let's find out when the optimal times to trade are. Trading sessions during the week are, uh, well, the, the, the trading session for the week is basically um, six days of the week you can trade. The Forex market is open 24 hours a day, but not all times of day are equal. Understanding why is an important lesson for any trader, so that they can adapt their trading style to suit the market conditions. Liquidity, or the ability to fill a trade without significant shifts in price, is a key concern when comparing various times of day. Highly liquid pairs, like the Euro USD, can soak up very large orders without blinking, but more exotic pairs will likely slip more noticeably when a very large order is placed. This is because there are less counter orders in the market, meaning that the large order consumes all the nearby counter orders at various prices before eventually being fill, uh, fully filled. This effect is exaggerated during low liquidity times. In reality, the exceptional size of the FX market will mean that the smooth opening and closing of positions won't really be a concern, except for the very largest traders. But what is worth noting is how the behavior of the market changes during periods of varying liquidity. For high liquidity, there needs to be a large number of orders in the market. So it fits at the highest liquidity periods of the day are when the largest number of traders are active in the market. And the key times we want to focus on are the London and New York time, uh, the London and New York session, because those are the most, um, most participated in sessions, and so they offer the greatest liquidity. The London market opens at 8 a.m. and trades through to 5 p.m. GMT and dominates the Forex marketplace. So the larger moves are often st started during this session. The London Open at 8 a.m. is often a turning point for the day's trading activities, and large trending moves can frequently be observed during this session. The UK and European data is typically early in the London session. So when Asia closes at 10 a.m., there can be a slight lull until NY, until New York opens, unless there is a strong trend to keep things ticking along. New York opens at 1 p.m. and closes at 10 p.m. GMT. New York is where the trading day and therefore the trading week ends. U.S. data is typically early in the session too, so the crossover from London to New York is one of the most important times of the day for traders. Liquidity is at its highest, spreads typically at their lowest, and the risk of exhausting trend moves, uh, exhausted trend reversing is high. As London closes, what is referred to as the New York afternoon begins. The trading activity dies down, but there are still a lot of traders in America sitting at the desk. As such, if an important piece of news hits during this time, it can display remarkable volatility, which again makes news and breakout trading favorable during this quieter period. So now we have an understanding of when to trade, what we're thinking about now is how do we identify our trades? And principally, we're going to look at, well, we're just going to briefly introduce you now to the two types of core analysis. There are two, there are really two, there, there are two headline types of analysis traders can undertake when looking at the markets. There's fundamental analysis and technical analysis. Technical analysis, sometimes split into two types of analysis, technical and price action, is the concept of looking at current and previous price movements to attempt to determine where a currency is going. This is done on charts. The reason most people like this type of analysis is that it's relatively quick, depending upon your level of skill, and it presents a good overview. It can be shown to work in, and is typically less subjective. Essentially then, the idea is to use previous price movements to predict future price movements. Some say that future price movements are random and therefore cannot be predicted from a chart. However, 
when many, many analysts study the same chart using the same tools, the future price predictions can almost become self-fulfilling prophecies. This is true more so in the Forex markets than, for example, individual equities or stocks. These standard tools are really indicators that use the underlying price data to predict price movements based on previous empirical evidence of events reoccurring. Part of the reason some technical techniques work is that they reflect some underlying movement in the price order book. As mentioned before, in some cases, this is because if enough people follow the technique, it becomes self-fulfilling. So many only work in very specific conditions. Beyond the price charts, technical analysis also focuses a lot on key levels, turning points and potential players such as, if this happens, then this is likely to happen, or if that happens, then something else is more likely to happen. Second type of analysis is fundamental analysis. Fundamental analysis is a way of looking at the market by analyzing economic, social, and political forces that affect the supply and demand of an asset. This should, in theory, be present perfect information, and therefore certainty. But the challenge is that a lot of it is subjective and can be interpreted in many ways. The idea of all this information is that it translates into underlying orders in the order book, and thus creates the real supply and demand mentioned earlier. There will be more detail on how different market themes can impact the fundamental outlook in greater detail in our future sessions. But for now, the general concept is that if a country's economic outlook is good, then their currency should be worth more. If it's bad, then the currency should be worth less. Okay, guys, well, that wraps up the, the core content for today. And I hope that's given you a, um, a decent overview of the, the fundamentals for, um, for Forex. What I'm happy to do now is, um, is take any questions you might have regarding, uh, regarding the content we've covered today. Um, feel free to type into the, chat, into the chat box any questions you have, and, uh, and I'll work through them now. I'll, uh, I'll just give you a minute to do that, and I'll, uh, I'll take a quick sip of coffee. Okay, if you want to just type into, uh, into the chat box any questions that you have. Well, I must have done an astonishingly good job of explaining all that, um, as there aren't any questions at this stage. Um, well, if there aren't any questions, uh, I guess what we will do is, um, is wrap this up uh, here for today. Um, we're going to move into to next week's session. We're going to look at the importance of, uh, of a trading plan and the idea of, uh, of putting together a, a, a business plan and a trading plan to underpin your, your future success in, in the markets. So I thank you all for, uh, for your time today. I hope you found this content useful um, and I look forward to, to seeing you in next week's session uh, where we will look in detail at uh, the importance of a trading plan. Thanks very much for your time guys and uh, have a great day.